the movie begins with a stunning scene. It's nighttime in the beautiful city of San Francisco. The place is rather peaceful and serene with an exception of only one thing. As the movie progresses, we see trains running on their tracks while small vehicles collide with one another. Just then, a loud sound is heard and a bright light flashes from afar. The usually peaceful alleyways are filled with cheers and shouts. All the people hiding within the dark nooks and crannies of the city seem to be having a good time while watching some sort of battle. Individuals of all ages compete in this game of bot fighting. Robots are made to battle one another, with people betting on which one will eventually win. Amongst the players is Yama who happens to be the reigning champion of bot fighting. Everyone fears him as he simply smashes the opposing bot. Just when one round of fighting is over, Yama challenges someone else to a duel. However, no one wants to compete against him. Yama smirks as he thinks he's won but just then, Hiro Hamada, a 14-year-old genius, enters the ring. He has a little bot in his hands that everyone laughs at. The bot seems to be very shabby and harmless. Hiro then tells Yama that he wants to experiment with his very own self-made robot in the bot fight. Yama just laughs while everyone else mocks the little boy. Hiro quickly pays his entry fee and faces off against Yama's bot, which breaks Hiro's bot into three pieces. Hiro is devastated but pays for a rematch. During the second round, he shows off his bot's true abilities. Unlike any other bot, Hiro's robot fixes itself. Within seconds, the harmless-looking robot disassembles Yama's bot fighter. Even though Hiro's robot appears to be tiny, it is really powerful. Hiro easily wins the fight and receives his prize money. However, Yama is enraged that his money is now gone. Desperate, he threatens Hiro with his goons. At that very moment, Tadashi who happens to be Hiro's older brother arrives on his motorcycle in order to help him. Soon enough, Tadashi pulls Hiro free, but they both get arrested since Hiro bet on the bot fight. Bot fighting is illegal, therefore no one can play it. Despite this, Hiro continues engaging in such fights and wins illegal money. Tadashi is upset by his brother's behavior and warns Hiro by telling him that if he doesn't stop, he will get arrested. As expected, both of them are detained. However, they're not the only ones to land inside bars. All the other gamblers are caught and imprisoned as well. Moments later, Hiro and Tadashi's aunt, Cass, comes to their rescue. After the boys' parents lost their lives, Aunt Cass took them in. It's been almost 10 years since then. Aunt Cass loves both of them like her own sons. So when she found out that the two were in trouble, she rushed to save them. Once Cass gets to the police station, she looks over at the boys' guilty faces. She immediately bails them out, but it's evident that she's furious. All three of them return home, which happens to be directly above the Café Cassones. She has tried everything she could to raise them. However, she feels as though it's not enough. Hiro notices that his aunt feels like they are a failure which makes him feel really guilty. Moments later, both he and Tadashi express their regret and apologize to her. Cass immediately forgives them, and they all share a loving moment together. At night, Tadashi scolds Hiro for his care carelessness and asks what he wants to do with his life. Since Hiro is a prodigy, he has already graduated high school at the mere age of 13. Hiro just shrugs and says that he wants to continue bot fighting since it makes him a lot of money. Hearing this, Tadashi just sighs and asks Hiro to join his college. However, Hiro immediately refuses and claims that he doesn't want to go to a nerd school. Having no other choice, Tadashi tells Hiro that he'll take him to another bot fighting match. Upon hearing this, Hiro is ecstatic and instantly gets on Tadashi's bike. However, instead of taking Hiro to a bot fighting match, the latter takes him to the supposed nerd school. It turns out that Tadashi's college is the San Francisco Tech Institute. It's nothing like Hiro has ever seen. As he gets deeper and deeper into the college, Hiro finds himself getting more awestruck. Tadashi finally leads Hiro to his laboratory. When Hiro looks at all of the inventors and their inventions, he is simply blown away. Unlike before, Hiro is now desperate to get into this college. After some time, Tadashi introduces Hiro to all his other brilliant inventor friends, including Gogo Tomego, who invented a motorcycle with electromagnetic wheels, Wasabi, who works with a plasma laser, Honey Lemon, a bright and energetic girl who creates large smoke bubbles, and Fred, who is only the school's mascot but has now taken a keen interest in science. Hiro excitedly meets everyone, and they all seem to be really cool. However, Tadashi drags him away just then and takes him into a room. Much to Hiro's protests, Tadashi wraps duct tape around his forearm and then pulls it off. Hiro screams in anguish, triggering Tadashi's invention. It's a healthcare robot named Baymax. However, the robot is less like a medical assistant and more like a fluffy, squishy marshmallow. Baymax comes into action and quickly examines Hiro's discomfort level. Since Baymax is capable of scanning anything, he quickly scans Hiro's entire body and finds the wounded area. Then, using a spray, Baymax heals Hiro's hand. In order to satisfy Hiro, Baymax even hands him a lollipop. After witnessing Baymax's treatment, Hiro expresses satisfaction with the results. This causes the fluffy robot to deactivate, 
Afterward, Tadashi explains to Hiro that this version of Baymax was his most successful human creation. Just then, Tadashi's lecturer, Robert Callaghan, enters. Hiro quickly recognizes him from his studies and investigations, which motivates him even further to attend this institution. When Robert learns that Hiro is a bot fighter, he wishes the latter luck and expresses his delight at meeting Hiro. Tadashi's plan has now worked. What's left is getting Hiro into the institution which is the most difficult part. Tadashi advises Hiro that impressing Callaghan by presenting an idea for a school showcase is an excellent method to get into the school. Hearing this, Hiro begins to generate ideas but becomes frustrated when none of them are good. Despite being a youthful prodigy, Hiro appears to be unable to use his brain for anything other than entering unlawful, back-alley bot fights. Tadashi eventually motivates Hiro to look at the project from a different perspective. Hiro agrees and that's when he gets an amazing idea. After a long while of working, Hiro's latest innovation is complete. Tadashi and Hiro arrive at school the next morning with their invention. On that particular day, they observe a lot of amazing techs. Both brothers are also present to demonstrate their idea. Hiro, Tadashi, and their pals wheel barrels into the room. Hiro is tense, but Tadashi encourages him to relax. He's nervous as everyone thinks he's simply a youngster who is simply no competition for them. Finally, the time comes and Hiro reveals his invention. Microbots, before Callaghan and everyone else. When he takes one out, hundreds more drop out of the barrels. It turns out that Hiro can command the microbots to perform anything by wearing a neurotransmitter headband. Needless to say, Hiro's presentation impressed several attendees, including a high-profile technical guru named Alistair Cray. Everyone applauds Hiro, and Tadashi is overjoyed. Aunt Cass is also really proud of him. She is overjoyed that her nephew is happy, and doing what he likes which thankfully, happens to be completely legal. After Hiro's performance is over, Alistair offers to buy his microbot idea. However, Robert Callaghan arrives at the scene and argues that Cray is not a trustworthy man when it comes to technology. Hearing this, Hiro graciously declines the offer and informs him that they are not for sale. Callaghan then hands Hiro an envelope with an invitation to enroll in classes. Hiro is on cloud 9 and immediately expresses his gratitude to Tadashi for bringing him to school. All of a sudden, loud screams are heard and people can be seen running away. Hiro and Tadashi return to the building only to find out that it's on fire. Just then, Tadashi discovers Callaghan is still inside and without thinking, he jumps into the building as well. However, within seconds, the building explodes, eliminating both Callahan and Tadashi. Hiro completely loses his mind and begs for his brother to come back but he's gone now. Soon after, Tadashi and Professor Callaghan both have memorials. Everyone near and dear to the deceased attends the funeral. Afterward, Tadashi's pals visit him at home to comfort Hiro and Cass. However, nothing works and Hiro remains depressed in his room. He withdraws from all his friends after Tadashi's burial, still processing his sadness. Cass then tries to persuade him into attending the institute but Hiro just seems unwilling. One day, Hiro is still in his room mourning his brother. Depressed, he picks up his small bot. That's when a piece of it falls on his foot, and he yells in anguish. Surprisingly, Baymax reactivates. The Medicare robot immediately comes to rescue, and tries to relieve Hiro's discomfort, but Hiro claims he is alright. Just then, Baymax notices Hiro's last microbot crawling around in its container. Baymax chooses to pursue it, which leads him out into the streets. Hiro has no idea as to what's happening and starts following Baymax. After running for a while, the two arrive at a warehouse. There, they discover that the microbot is attempting to connect to thousands of other microbots developed by an unknown person. Hiro is confused because no one else had done this before. He tries to find out who's behind this but just then, the microbots band together and try to assault Hiro and Baymax. Seeing that he's in danger, Hiro immediately flees the scene with Baymax. While running, the boy notices a man in a kabuki mask manipulating the oncoming microbots. Desperate, Hiro throws Baymax out the window and falls down with him. Since Baymax is really soft, the little boy is unharmed. Afterward, Hiro rushes to the police station with Baymax to report the incident, but the officer is skeptical of his story. He then rushes home with Baymax and decides that they must apprehend the masked villain. After all, microbots can be very dangerous when in the wrong hands. Baymax hears all this and only accepts it, because he believes that this might help Hiro's emotional state. Hiro commences his mission and fashions a carbon fiber outfit for Baymax. In order to make Baymax more reliable, he merges a series of combat methods onto a chip and inserts it into Baymax's access port. The cup resides exactly next to the healthcare chip that Tadashi had originally designed for Baymax. Once everything is ready, Hiro and Baymax track the microbot down to the city's harbor. The two try to find all the other bots. However, they are unaware that they are being followed by an automobile. The stalkers are none other than Gogo, Wasabi, Honey, and Fred. 
They know about Hyro's plan, because Baymax felt Hyro was in emotional turmoil and required the support of pals. When Hyro comes to learn about this, he gets mad at Baymax but decides to let it rest. The team then tries to find the other microbots. However, just then, the masked villain arrives and attacks them all. The attacker summons his microbots to hurl a massive crate at them. Seeing this, Hyro orders Baymax to fight, but the villain throws him into the air. The villain looks like he's out for blood so the gang immediately boards the car, and Wasabi speeds away with the villain still in their pursuit. However, Wasabi drives way too cautiously and slowly. Annoyed, Gogo takes the wheel and starts driving recklessly. She avoids all the microbots and flees the scene. In the end, they manage to avoid the villain by driving the automobile into the river. Later, Baymax lifts everyone to the surface. After this incident, Hiro and his team learn that they are against a very skilled villain. In order to defeat him, they need to gear up as well. Soon, Fred takes the gang to his house for refuge, which happens to be a massive mansion owned by his parents. His room is filled with monster statues, comic novels, and action figures. After brainstorming for a while, Fred deduces that the masked villain must be Alistair Cray who must have ignited the fire at the school in order to steal Hyro's microbots. Hyro agrees as the story seems really plausible. Baymax then explains that he had scanned the villain at the dock. This means that even though it's very little, they have information on him. Finally, Hyro devises a scheme to enhance not only Baymax, but also the rest of the gang. The aim is to obtain the villain's mask because he could be concealing the neurotransmitter headband beneath it. Without the transmitter, the bots are completely useless. Hyro then quickly manufactures outfits and weapons for the whole group while they practice removing the mask from Fred's butler, Heathcliff. Honey uses tungsten carbide balls to create foam and harden in order to capture the villain. Gogo uses electromagnetic roller blades and discs. Wasabi has lasers on his arms, and Fred wears a monster suit that allows him to jump high and breathe fire. Meanwhile, Hyro creates a suit for himself as well as one for Baymax that can fly and has a rocket fist. He puts the suit on Baymax, and the two fly all over the city for a test ride. While flying, Baymax notices that Hyro's emotional state is improving. The squishy robot then checks everyone in the city as the two sit high above the metropolis. Soon, on an island far from the city, Hyro discovers a living entity that resembles their enemy. Baymax quickly transports the gang to the island. There, they discover an abandoned laboratory with a broken machine. Inside the lab, the gang discovers a videotape on the computer. The video shows Cray and his scientists demonstrating two gateways they built to employ teleportation. The young woman sits inside a pod and is about to enter the first portal. Suddenly, one of the scientists informs Cray about an anomaly, but the latter just dismisses it. The woman passes through the portal, which then becomes unstable. Soon enough, the scientists are forced to shut down the portal as it begins to suck everything else in. The second portal immediately closes, trapping the woman inside. Just as the villain attacks the team, the gang realizes that Cray is the masked villain. They eventually figure out that he wants to steal Hyro's microbots in order to construct the portal. The team soon tries to capture the attacker while using their suits. But just then, Honey gets hit by one of Gogo's discs, causing her to slip on one of the carbide balls. As the adversary throws them off, Fred and Wasabi collide. Suddenly, Hyro is lifted into the air by Baymax, allowing him to tackle the villain to the ground and remove his mask. When the enemy turns around, the whole gang is shocked to see that it is none other than Professor Callaghan, who is still alive and well. Frustrated, Callahan tells Hyro that he employed the neurotransmitter and microbots to defend himself from the blast. When Hyro learns about this, he loses his mind. Tadashi had jumped into the fire just to save Callahan. Turns out that he passed away for nothing. Furious, Hyro informs Callahan that Tadashi passed away while attempting to save him. Instead of feeling guilty, Callaghan simply remarks that it was his fault. Hyro, enraged, orders Baymax to destroy Callaghan. He quickly removes the healthcare chip and engages the combat chip in Baymax, allowing the robot to assault Callahan. The rest of the team attempts to stop Baymax but it's no use. Anxious, Honey gets into the access port and replaces the combat chip once again. This allows Baymax to stop. However, Callahan uses this opportunity to flee. Meanwhile, the four are stunned by Hyro's actions, as he angrily orders Baymax to fly away. At home, Hyro repairs Baymax's scanner and attempts to locate Callahan. He then tries to remove the healthcare chip once more, but the access is denied. Baymax has already realized that Hyro wants to use him for destruction. However, that's not his true purpose. Hyro angrily exclaims that Tadashi is gone. He wants revenge but Baymax simply says that Tadashi would not have wanted this. He then says that Tadashi is still here and turns on a small television on his chest that displays footage from Tadashi's development of Baymax. After 83 failed tests, the 84th was a success and the true Baymax was created. Tadashi is overjoyed when he sees that Baymax is now completely operational. He expresses his excitement to demonstrate his invention to Hyro and claims that Baymax will improve people's lives. Once Hyro is done watching, he breaks down. Kadashi would have never wanted all this as he was a pure soul. 
Hyrule sobs as he embraces Baymax. Meanwhile, Heathcliff brings all the others to Hyrule and they embrace him. Eventually, they agree to support him and properly apprehend Callahan. A while later, Honey hands Hyrule a drive with more footage. In the video, Callahan is shown running aggressively toward Cray shortly after the portal is shut down. Another video shows Callahan hugging the woman as she enters the pod. Confused, Hyrule pauses the video and zooms in on the woman's helmet, revealing the name Callaghan. That's when they realize that the woman is Robert's daughter, Abigail Callahan. Since she's gone forever, Callahan is now out for vengeance on Cray. Elsewhere, Cray has hosted a celebration at his company's headquarters. However, just then, Callaghan enters and begins attacking everyone present there with the microbots. He then goes on to recreate the portal while slowly destroying Cray's building before throwing the ladder through the portal. The heroes arrive just in time to fight. An immense fight begins where Callaghan attacks Hyro's buddies with the microbots. That's when Hyro is flung from Baymax and nearly sucked through the vortex. In order to defeat Callahan, Hyro encourages his buddies to use a different perspective, much like Tadashi used to do. The four eventually utilize their weapons to free themselves from the microbots. Hyro is then saved by Baymax. Right at that moment, an idea strikes Hyro's mind, and he quickly instructs his friends to transfer the microbots through the portal so that Callaghan cannot use them anymore. Luckily, they are successful which leaves Callaghan with nothing but sorrow. He is about to be taken into the portal when Baymax grabs him. The portal finally crashes on Earth while still remaining active. Just then, Baymax claims to have detected a living form emerging from the portal. It's none other than Abigail who's in hypersleep. Hearing this, Hyro rides Baymax through the vortex to save Abigail, who is thankfully still alive. The two find her pod among the wreckage of Kray's structure and bring her toward the portal. However, a massive piece of debris strikes Baymax's armor, causing him to lose half of it. His rocket thrusters have failed, and he knows he won't be able to recover them all. Seeing that there's no way out, Baymax tells Hyro that he can return him and Abigail. However, Hyro must first assure Baymax that he is happy with his care. Hyro gets emotional and does not want to leave Baymax. He goes on to say that he's not happy with his care in the hope that Baymax might come along. Sadly, that's not possible so Hyro just cries as he hugs Baymax and expresses his gratitude for his care. While Baymax drifts away, Hyro and Abigail are pushed through the vortex by Baymax's rocket fist. The two escape from the portal just as the gateway explodes. Hyro appears numb when he finally steps outside. His pals are relieved to see him safe and celebrate. Later, they all agree that Baymax was Tadashi's best innovation. A while later, Callaghan is arrested, while Abigail awakens and is taken to the hospital. He stands there in shame, knowing he may never see his daughter again. On the other hand, the city recognizes the gang's valor, unknowing of their true identities. Once everything is over, Hyro hangs out with Gogo, Wasabi, Honey, and Fred at Cass's cafe. There, Hyro lays the rocket fist down in his room. Suddenly, it opens up and exposes that the healthcare chip is still in place. Seeing this, Hyro gets excited and uses the chip and is the first to reconstruct Baymax exactly as Tadashi had designed. Fortunately, he is successful and Baymax comes alive. The two then exchange hugs. Days pass by and Hyro finally realizes what his brother would have actually wanted. Even though Tadashi is not here anymore, his inventions and thoughts still remain. In order to pay his respects to Tadashi and keep him alive forever, Hyro and his buddies plan to help people in distress. They all dress up in their uniforms and team up with Baymax to become Big Hero 6. Together, they strive to rid the world of pain and suffering. In the end, Fred is shown looking at a family portrait in his home. Distressed, he expresses regret for not being a better son. Just as Fred touches the image, a secret area filled with gadgets and suits is unlocked. Fred enters the place to see a whole lot of high-tech gadgets and spandex underwear. Suddenly, his father arrives from behind him while also holding a pair of spandex underwear. Ecstatic, Fred hugs his father, and the two reconcile. The movie finally ends with Fred's dad claiming that they have a lot of catching up to do.